Amen. Well, good evening. Good to see you. It's getting to be warm for this week. I'm a happy guy. Um, come on up, Pastor Doug. Doug and I look a lot alike, don't we? Sometimes people go up and tell him what a great service it was, and he says, thank you very much. And, or, but he's yeah, I like a dozen. Do, I just, do, I just I, take it. Okay, yeah, that's right. Ten, he's a dozen years younger than I am, so. But I think we could be brothers otherwise, you know what I'm saying? Brothers? Twins. Father, father, son, maybe brothers. I had a child at 12? <laughs> well, I don't think that happened. Anyway, so Pastor Doug's been with us for many years, and, and we thought it would be good for you to get to know him a little better, so I'll just give you the floor. I'm not asking questions. I'm just going to let you... Re- you're a pastor. You should be able to just talk for an hour. <laughs> but don't. All right. <laughs> you know I can well, Pastor Jack asked me to come and, and share my testimony with him. You know, it was funny. I was, we were talking the other day, and I shared something about my life and, and um, before I got saved and, and uh, work God did in my life before I even knew him. And, and I've known Jack for so many years, and he said, gosh, I never knew that about you. And he realized there's, there's lots of things about our lives that, that we others don't know. But I know God's given each of us a testimony of how we came to know him and how that happened, and, and what he's done since that time. So I want to take just a, a few quick moments and, and share with you, in a nutshell, where I came from, how I met the Lord, and, and what he's done and taught me in, in those years. So yeah, 12 minutes, it'll be good. <laughs> and I, I was raised right here in La Habra. I was born in, in Tulare, California. No hoots for Tulare. But... Uh, <laughs> But we moved here when I was just a baby and, and we lived in a house here in La Habra. My dad still lives in that same house. But I grew up right here in this area. I had a great mother and father. They, they loved me. I, I was the youngest of three children, an oldest sister and a middle brother and, and then me, the baby of the family. And I had a wonderful childhood. You know, I know we hear sometimes testimonies of, of oh, it was horrible and this and that. I really had a great childhood. It wasn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, my parents were Christian scientists, and they raised us in the Christian Science Church. Now, it's not Scientology. Christian Science is different. Um, it's kind of a, a, a name that doesn't fit. There's no Christian. There's no science in it. Um, they don't believe in many of the things that we do as Christians. They don't believe in the deity of Christ or, or sin or heaven or hell or judgment or, or, or any of those such things. No sickness or illness. So it's very different from the Christian faith. But, but as growing up, they don't teach you a lot of that doctrine. You just learn Bible stories when you go there and some songs and those kinds of things. So I didn't have a lot of religious background growing up. But I had a wonderful childhood. You know, I, my parents loved me. They, I played Little League and, and, and where it was in the Indian Guides. You guys remember the Indian Guides? And uh, all those kinds of things, you know. But there was something... What? Indian guides? No, that's the Boy Scouts. You can't, these scouts. But there was one thing in my life that that stuck out from a very early age. Um, I had an anger issue. And it was always there from the time I was young. And it wasn't because something was done to me or I had a bad experience when I was young. It was just something that was inside of me. I had a very short fuse and a quick temper and, and it was violent at times. There were times when my brother would just simply call me a name. Something simple, every brother does, but boy, I would get so angry. And, and there were times when my dad had to pull me off of him because I, I just couldn't control my anger. And as I got older, yes, there's a chair over there. It gets better at the end. But as I got older, it, it didn't get any better. It just got worse and worse. And by the time I was in high school and and started dabbling in, in drinking and partying and, and even drugs at that time. You could imagine those things were like throwing gasoline on a fire. And it was just out of control. And it was to a point where I couldn't even handle it myself. I get so frustrated at myself when, when I was angry or at some of the things that I do that I would just punch things. I would go rounds when I came home from school with, with the wooden garage door. And it just plagued me all of my life, you know? And, and, and it, I kind of came to the conclusion it was just something I couldn't control. I, I tried lots of times, but it always came back. 
Well, you know, I, I grew up, I, I moved to my parents' house, I, I got a job, and I was working at a uh, retail store over in Fullerton, Montgomery Wards. Remember that? Over on <laughs> Harbor and, and Orange Thorpe? And while I was working there, I, I had friends, and I, I met this girl there. She worked in linens, I worked in hardware, our eyes met, and, and, <laughs> and we liked each other. We, she was into the same kind of things I was. She liked to party and do all that stuff. So we started going out and, and, and we were together for a little while. The, the only problem was um, she had a boyfriend that she lived with. She had had a pretty rough childhood. She was abused by her stepdad. She uh, wanted to get out of there as soon as she could. And when she turned 18, she moved out and had no place to go. So she moved in with her boyfriend. That just, just became comfortable for her. So we went out for a while on the down low, but the time came where I, I left that job and I got another job and, and I didn't see her much anymore. Um, it wasn't like I could just call her on the phone at her home and it was way before cell phones. So, you know, I, I lost track with her for a good six, eight months or so. And then we saw each other at a mutual friend's, I think it was a birthday party for a mutual friend. And, you know, there was drinking and all that stuff there and and she came up and I said, hey, you know, and, and she just seemed different to me. She, I asked her, you know, how you been? What are you doing? Are you still living with that guy? And she said, no, I moved out from there two weeks ago. And she wasn't drinking. And there was something else that was different about her. She just had this joy. You know, I, I liked her before. You know, she was fun to be with and all those things. But she always had kind of this wall because of what she'd been through when she was a child. And she had this kind of attitude that was kind of like, well, you know what, I don't need you. And if you do something I don't like, fine, you can be gone and I'll be just fine. It was just kind of these walls of protection that she had put up, but, but she was different now. And I saw this, this genuine peace and joy in her. And I asked her, so, oh, you moved out, what happened? And she said, I gave my life to Jesus. She said, two, two and a half weeks ago, I gave my life to the Lord. And I knew that God didn't want me living with them, so I moved out. And I don't drink anymore. I've got this great peace. I've forgiven my stepdad. It was like amazing. And she said, why don't you come to church with me? She was going to church over at Calvary Chapel Downey. So I was like, church? I said, all right, I'll go with you. I, honestly, I was thinking, all right, we, maybe we can start seeing this girl again. So I started going to church with her. We went on Sunday mornings. We went on Wednesday nights. And, and this Jesus thing was the real deal with her. You know, she was all in. She, she would worship and, and open her Bible and, and just be excited about the things of God. And we did this for a while. I went to church with her so much that we kind of started dating again. And we did that for a couple months. Um, until one day she came to me and she said, you know, Doug, I, I, I love you. I, I hope you, you come and find the Lord. I want you to get saved, but I can't see you anymore. Because I was kind of dragging her back into some of those things that we used to do, into her old ways. And, and she said, her exact words were, you know, I, I, I love you. I want the best for you, but, but I love Jesus more. And I got to obey him. And, and the weirdest thing, I wasn't upset because by that time I knew that this was serious. She, she had a relationship with, with God, though I didn't quite understand all of it yet. So I kept going to church. It was a big church. There were three services, so we didn't always see each other there, rarely did. But I kept going. And I went on Sundays and Wednesday nights, on Sunday nights when I could. And I did that for another two or three months or so. Until one night I was there, I went to church on a Wednesday night and I went early because I wanted to get a Bible at the chapel store. I didn't have a Bible. And I'd like to tell you it's because God was, you know, I knew God was tugging on my heart and I needed a Bible. I was just tired of looking different from everybody else. I, I, I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. Everyone was walking with a Bible and I never did. And I know it, not everyone did, but it seemed that way. And it seemed like everyone was looking at me like, who's this guy without a Bible? So I went to the chapel store, I said, I need a Bible. And he said, well, what kind do you want? And I said, there's different kinds. And he knew I didn't know much about the Bible, so he said, I got a Bible for you. So he gave me this Bible, it's got, it had three different versions in it. The New Living Translation, the NIV, and the King James Version, all in one Bible. So you can imagine, this thing was a Bible, you know? 
So I bought it. I said, all right. And I walk into church with this Bible, and now I stuck out because it looked like a coffee table Bible, you know, that you have at home. But I thought, all right, I'm okay. I got a Bible. And they had a guest pastor there that night. He was sharing, uh, I'd like to tell you what scriptures it was, but he was just teaching and sharing the, the gospel. And at the end of his study, he said, if, if, if anybody in here doesn't know the Lord, I want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray for you. You raise your hand and say, Jesus, I give up. I, I want to know you. I want you to forgive my sins. And, and I want to be uh, your child. And, and I want you to be my Lord. And, and at that point, I knew that's what I needed to do. And when he asked and the heads were bowed, I raised my hand. And I heard him say, I, I see your hand. And I put it down. And I thought, all right, I, I did it. I, I'm a Christian. And then they started to sing the last song, and, and he said, now, if you are one of those who raised your hand, I want you to come down here in front, because I want to pray with you, and I, I, and I want to, to give you something, some Bible studies to take home with you. And I remember sitting there going, no way. <laughs> I raised my hand, the Lord saw me, I, I'm not going down there. And they sang the song once, and they sang it again, and, and he said, we're going to sing it one more time, and then we're going to pray. So if you haven't come down, now's your last chance. And while they were singing this song, I honestly don't remember making the decision. I just remember all of a sudden saying, excuse me, to the person next to me, and I was headed down front. And I'm so glad that I did. I went down, and there was a, a gentleman down there that, that prayed with me, you know, shared with me what, what, what God had done when I called upon his name, gave me some Bible studies to take home, and sent me on my way after church. And man, I was just excited. I, I knew that I knew that God had taken away my sins. I didn't understand that all the, the things that he was gonna do in my life. I was just thinking, I'm going to heaven. I don't have to worry about all the stuff that I've done before. But God would soon show me that, that he was gonna do much greater than I'd ever thought. From that night on, never once did I wanna drink again. I, I never wanted to do another drug, never had a, 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 a temptation or a, a, a uh, wanting to do any of those things. My anger, God started to work on that. And he, he started to take away my anger for, for people. And he's still kind of working on my anger for things, you know? I get frustrated sometimes when things don't go my way. But God has been doing such a, an awesome work in my life. And, and the only people I knew who were believers was that girl, her, her sister, and a friend of hers. So I called them, said, hey, I got saved. I gave my life to the Lord. And they were the only ones I knew. So we started hanging out. We'd go to their house and do Bible studies and, and pray. And, and she watched me for a while. I wasn't sure if I was just faking it or, or, and trying to get back together with her. But after a few months, she realized that I was really saved. And we started dating again. And I asked that girl to marry me. She's back there in the back. And we got married over at Calvary Chapel Downey in 1988. We'll be married 30 years at June 18th. And the Lord's done some wonderful things since then in our lives. We, we, we've adopted a little girl. We've got a granddaughter. You know, I, I came on staff here at Morningstar in, in 1995 as a children's pastor after serving in the children's ministry here for, for many years. And God has just shown himself so faithful to us. There's been lots of trials. And if I had time, I'd tell you about some of that stuff. But, but you, you just have to kind of, you know, look at the Lord and, and, and thank him for, for getting you through those times and just press forward to, God, I, I want more of you. I, I want to know more of what you have for me. And I want to close and, and leave you with, with just a couple things that, that, that God helped me with in my walk with him. Some things that, that you might want to remember in your walk with the Lord. They were things that, that, that moved me in my faith and, and helped me not to look back. Number one was fall in love with the word of God and, and go to church. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but, but, but go to church whenever it's open, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, you know, go to the small group studies, Take in as much of God's word as you can. Fall on your face and worship him and raise your hands. And get to know your Lord and your Savior like nobody else. 
The second thing that, that helped me along so much in my walk with the Lord was, was getting involved at church and, and serving him. You know, there's a great verse in, in 1 Peter 4.10. It says, each one has, has been given a gift. Minister that gift to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, God's gifted you with a, a gift to serve each other here in the body. So find out what that is and serve. I tell you, I, I never grew so much as when I was teaching two and three-year-olds the, the, the Bible and, and, and singing with them, Jesus loves me. I, I watched God do amazing things and, and my faith grew. So, so do that. Don't just come and, and sit. God wants to use you to bless others and he wants others to bless you. Get to know other people here in church as you serve. And lastly, the, the third thing that really still moves me today is I grew up in the Lord with an expectancy that Jesus is coming back, that our Lord is going to return at any time, at any moment. I don't hear that as much in the body today. But boy, when I was growing up in the Lord, it was all we talked about. Hey, Jesus could come today. And it helps you in times of temptation. It helps you as you're wanting to share with somebody, but maybe you're a little bit timid. Hey, the Lord could come today. I should tell him about Jesus. I should not be doing that. Jesus could come today. Live with an expectancy that, that at any moment, you know, you, you could hear the, 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 the shout of the Lord and of the, and of the archangel, the, the trump of God, and we could be caught up to forever be with the Lord. It could happen at any moment. And you live your life with that kind of expectancy. And boy, the, the, the things of this world just fade away. And all you think about is being with Jesus for all eternity. And those are, are just three things that have, have helped me so much in my walk with the Lord. So I'd encourage you, do those things and draw close, close to the Lord and he'll continue to do amazing things. I, I wanna see the Lord face to face, as I'm sure you do. But God's got so, such, such, such awesome plans for us here as a body. So take advantage of every moment God gives you. Thanks a lot. Amen. Pray for you. All right, let's pray for Pastor Doug. Father, we thank you for the ministry that you've given to Doug for his many years of serving here in the body and, and just for the plans you have down the road for him yet. And may you continue to... Draw him close, give him hope. That love that he has for you and, and for your word, may it not diminish, but may it even grow stronger as the days go by. That you would be honored and glorified in his life and his family's life. That you would touch his family that isn't saved, those that don't know you, that he's been praying for. That you would intercede and, and do great things. And Lord, we thank you for uh, setting over us a, a, a shepherd with a heart to serve you. May you uh, keep your hands upon him and his family, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody. Bless you. <clears throat> Did pretty good on time, too, for Doug likes to talk. <laughs> Most pastors do. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight to the book of Acts, chapter 13. And we're going to start at verse 14. I hope you have your maps with you. If not, there's one up here on the wall. It'd be hard to see if you're a ways back. But we do have them at the counter. You can ask one of the ushers on your way out. You should have those in your Bible, especially for the rest of the book of Acts, because we're going to use them quite a bit. <clears throat> the birth of the church in a place called Antioch in Syria was the consequence of the gospel being taken by men who had gone to Jerusalem especially those from a place called Cyrene and a place called Cyprus. And when they were in Jerusalem, you remember that Stephen was murdered and the church fled. And everyone kind of went in different directions, but, but these men ended up in Antioch in Syria. It is on that map kind of to the right there. It says Cilicia down below there. And they began to share the gospel, not just with the Jews, but with Hellenists. And Hellenists, by definition, are Jews who live in Greek cultures. So their practices are non-Jewish oftentimes. And the further away from Jerusalem you get, the, the looser, the laxer, if you will, the practices become. So these men left 
Jerusalem, the place of tremendous religion, if you will, and they ended up 300 miles to the north sharing their faith with others. At the same time, it was Peter who was being led by the Lord to Cornelius' house to officially present, if you will, the gospel to the Gentiles. Now that's going to cause some problems in the, in the weeks and the months to come as, as you know, the Jews now have to understand that God is going to save Gentiles. That wasn't in their agenda at all. So there's a learning curve here. There's a, a religious prejudice to overcome. And, and Peter ending up at Cornelius', Cornelius house was certainly a, a move in the right direction, if you will. But as this church in the north began to grow, Jerusalem got wind of it. They sent Barnabas there to check it out. He traveled the 300 miles from Jerusalem to the north. He spent quite a while just encouraging the saints, answering Bible questions. He was kind of an OG in the, in the church, right? He was an original guy. So he was, he was just sharing and, and, and people were being blessed. The church began to grow. Barnabas didn't think, think he was a teacher. He went 100 miles or so up and around to Tarsus where Paul had gone. Might have been there seven, eight, ten years in, in obscurity. But he knew Paul. He had met Paul. He, he believed God would have Paul to come. He talked Paul into coming to the church there in Antioch. And they began to teach every day for a year. And the place just exploded. And they became really the missions church for the first century. And the, the center of ministry for the church, young church, really moves from Jerusalem to Antioch in Syria. There is a church in, in Jerusalem. There would be for years. But most of the evangelism, if you will, took place uh, far to the north. And it kind of came and went from there. So two weeks ago, we, we started... Um, and looked at the calling in chapter 13 and, and the commissioning of, of these two men, Paul and Barnabas, who after some time felt led of the Lord and moved by the Spirit to begin to go on what we'd, we now know as three missionary journeys. The first one would take about two years. The second one would last nearly six years, about four years after the first. The third one would last about two years and would be almost immediately after the second. So we, we'll try to kind of give you the, the, the span of travel, the time spent, because those kind of help you to get, a, I think, a fuller picture of what's going on. But, but last week, we went out with them on their first missionary journey. It was Paul, it was Barnabas, and because they had gone to Jerusalem to donate some money for a famine that a prophet said would be coming, they brought back Barnabas' nephew, John Mark, from Jerusalem in tow, and they were sent out from this church in Antioch to go on what we now call their first missionary journey. They went down to Seleucia, it is the port city there uh, in Syria, if you will. They got on a boat, they headed for Cyprus, a hundred miles away to the uh, eastern coast of Cyprus, a place called Salamis. They landed, they went to the Jewish synagogue, which is a common practice that Paul would pick. He went to the, the Jews first. Not only is it the Jews first in, in terms of God's plan, it was the Jews first because if they could get a foothold amongst the people that had biblical backgrounds, that's a lot of ground you can cover fairly quickly. And these are folks that were waiting for a Messiah and they had missed, missed him. So Paul would always go to the, to the synagogue first and, and he does it from the very beginning. There is no response and we're not told of the response at that Jewish synagogue in Salamis. It was 100 miles or so of sailing. It would be another 100 miles to go across Cyprus to the other side, to the political capital, if you will, in Paphos. And, and they, they arrived there to hear that there was a governor named Sergius Paulus who really wanted to hear from God. He, he saw something, he heard something, he was excited, he was the pro or the governor but there was a false prophet, and most of the guys in the, those days had advisors. This guy happened to be a demon-possessed guy who really didn't want anything to do with, with uh, Jesus. His, his name was Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus, can you imagine? Or Eliamus, as they called him. And he tried to interrupt the meeting. But, but God, through Paul, cursed this man who went blind, much like Paul did for a time. They were able to share with the governor who, as a result, gave his life to the Lord, but that was the extent of the fruit. In fact, we spent a lot of times talking last week about ministry, that sometimes you just have to be faithful, that the fruit follows, it comes later. You don't get to see it right away. It's not like working in a production company where you can say, look at all that we, we built or everything that we produced. You just have to be faithful and God will use you. 
Well, they got done with the island, so to speak, with very little fruit. One you know, governor on the, on the list of accomplishments. They get back in the boat and they sail north to Perga. Perga was the uh, capital of Pamphylia. It should be marked on your map as well. And then when they landed there, about 175 miles or so to travel, they had a couple of decisions to make. They could go uh, west along the coast, which would kind of wrap them up in Tarsus, and that's where Paul would be very familiar with the land, or they could head north. The problem is north was the Tars, Taurus Mountains, extremely dangerous. It was almost like a, uh, uh, you know, one of those rough areas that, that, that only Rome had even just temporarily, or, 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 or not temporarily, but they hadn't completely taken it in as their, their own, if you will. It was a tough Galatia province, but it was where nothing had gone on, where nothing had, had happened. So Paul says, let's go north. John Mark, Barnabas' little nephew, goes, yeah, you're nuts. This is going to kill us. We're, we're not good. We haven't had much fruit to begin with. And so Paul was extremely sick. Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. Galatia is where all of this is taking place. You can see on your map, Antioch and Galatia, Iconium, Lystra, those are all Galatian cities, if you will, or the province of Galatia. And, and Paul may very well have had malaria. That's what most uh, commentators think because of the symptoms that are mentioned in a couple of places. In, in any event, John Mark bails out, goes home, and leaves uh, Paul and, and Barnabas alone. We finished last week in verse 13. Uh, which says, and the, uh, sorry, but when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Pergia in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. This, this evening, we'd like to start at verse 14, and we're going to stop at verse 41. And the reason we're going to stop there, it, it, is, it is the recording of, of, of Luke to give us the ser first sermon that Paul preaches on this first missionary journey. In Perga, uh, all of Galatia, it seemed, was on Paul's heart. He didn't want to go west. He, he wanted to go north. The thing is, the, these Tarsus mountains, for him to travel to Antioch on your map there, is about another 100 miles. And it's 3,600 feet up and over. It is filled with uh, extremely bad people, if you will. The, the Romans, like I said, had only partially tamed it. Um, I'm sure that Paul heard stories about this place as a kid because he grew up um, east of there, if you will. But these guys, if nothing else, as, as missionary, had, had a tremendous faith and adventure and kind of fearlessness. Um, Dan Finfrock, who is a, a man that we've supported for years, I've probably known him 30 years or so, called me up last year and invited me to go to Iraq with him. And I, he, I said, where are we going to go? He says, well, I'm going to teach some pastors in Iraq. I said, how are you going to get there? He says, we're going to sneak across the border. And I said, let me just pray about that. No. And I didn't <laughs> even bat an eye. But before I hung up, I prayed for him. And I thought, you know, you've got to be a, a guy that's called, right, to do these kind of things. And I think that's true of, of Paul and Barnabas. They, there was nothing that they were afraid of. It, it does seem, as you read through the account this evening, that Paul and Barnabas did not stay in Perga where they landed to evangelize the city. There's no mention made of it at all. When we get to chapter 14, maybe verse 25 or so, on the way back they'll stop there and their ministry will continue. But for now, he had his sights on getting over the mountains and getting out into the wilderness and kind of surviving the trip, being led of the Holy Spirit. And so they set out for the Galatian area without John Mark. The trip was apparently made without incident. We're not told of anything that took place. But they eventually noticed come to this place, uh, Antioch, different Antioch. This one is Antioch of Pisidia. And they head first again um, to the synagogues. So we read in verse 14, when they departed from Pergia, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. They went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, and they said, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And so Paul stood up, motioned with his hands, and said, men of Israel, and you who are uh, fear God, listen. Again, notice that they went first to the synagogue. 
There was always that desire to, to get an open door to preach Jesus to people with biblical background. It, it's kind of like you going to share with somebody that doesn't know a Bible at all. For example, when, when Gerard and I a couple of years ago were teaching a, 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 a pastor's seminar in, in uh, Japan, the Bible is not a, a Japanese book. To them, at least the unbelievers, it's just a Western book. So you can't start there. You have to start somewhere else. And, and Paul with the Gentiles couldn't start with the book of Isaiah or, or, or Moses or David or the Psalms. He had nothing to go on except, you know, you're brokenhearted, you, you're hopeless, you, you're guilty, you, you can't overcome sin. I mean, you go to the, the, the basics of experience. But if you can go to the Jews and say, look, the, the prophet Isaiah said it and, and Jesus fulfilled it and, and the prophet Micah told us and, 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 and go through the scriptures and you can win some of them to Christ. Now you've got, you know, a built-in work. And so wherever the, there were synagogues, Paul, you would find them in a local synagogue. And these were people that God had prepared for 2,000 years with prophets and with teachers and with types and with stories of God's faithfulness. They were the people that had been promised a Messiah. He hadn't come as far as they were concerned. Paul could tell them and show them otherwise. Now, Paul, because he was a rabbi for years from the most prestigious school in Jerusalem, a guy named Gamaliel taught this particular school that he was on. I am sure that if they knew about him at all, he'd be invited to speak. You know, he was the celebrity of his generation, if you will. Uh, I don't know if here off the beaten track they were aware of him, but he almost everywhere he went got an initial invitation to speak. He oftentimes didn't get a second invitation to speak. You know, he wasn't burning his bridges, he was just using them well. And Paul always hoped to get a quick harvest that could become the nucleus of a church that he could leave behind by talking to folks who had a working knowledge of the scriptures. So we, we start here in verse 16 with Paul's first full sermon from the road, very similar to Peter's sermon, very similar to uh, Stephen's ser uh, uh, sermon. And here's the similarities, and maybe you know, Pastor Doug's teaching a class in one of our GLOW classes now on giving your testimony. I said to him today, you better do good. You're supposed to be teaching others how to do this. But uh, you find that the same approaches used by Paul and by Peter and by others, there was always a, a, uh, a review of past history so that you could bring people in with you. There was always a focus on Jesus being the proof of his deity and his, and his person by the, the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament. There's always a talk about his death at the hands of wicked men, his resurrection, and always a call to those who are listening to receive him by faith and be saved. History past, the fulfillment of Jesus' uh, life to the prophecies that were given, his death and resurrection, and this invitation. Paul had stood in the crowd and listened when Stephen had spoken, you remember? He had held the coats of those who had stoned Stephen to death. Stephen may have wondered dying if his life had done any good. I mean, he, he looked like he was losing or he had lost. What he didn't know on this side of heaven was the impact he was having on a man named Saul who was still very angry and, and caught up in his religious ways and what eventually his teaching would do to this man. Isaiah would write in chapter 55, that the word of God goes forth out of God's mouth and it never returns to him void. It, it always accomplishes what God pleases. It prospers in the things to which, to which he sends it. Stephen didn't see that. And I only mention that to you because so often you can share the word of God with people and they think, gosh, they just kind of looked at me funny. I don't think we got anywhere. But God's word doesn't go out worthlessly. It doesn't just lay on the table. The word of God is powerful and, and, and living and sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible says. So for us going out to share, um, sometimes I think about Stephen, you know, Paul and his fruitful ministry, this whole entire book of Acts, the rest of it, and many of the epistles are the, re the direct result, in some cases, of, of Stephen's faithful preaching. So don't give up sharing, because you're not sharing an idea or an opinion, you're sharing God's word which he stands behind. You have the full authority of the Lord behind it, right? The, the, the power of God. So Paul and Barnabas make it through the difficult 
travel. They get to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They sit amongst those that are very steeped in tradition. I'm sure that in the synagogue there were people hungry to know God, but they were blinded by their religious kind of unbelief. They sat through the reading of the prophets, a typical practice on the Sabbath, the reading of the law. And then they were invited to come and stand before the assembly to speak. I, I suspect that's exactly what they were praying for. And now they get their opportunity. Because Acts is a narrative, you really do need to read through the narrative and say, Lord, what am I supposed to learn here? And here's something you can learn from Paul watching uh, him travel in these, uh, over these years. And that is, God will use you if you're available. Now, maybe that's overstating an obvious fact. But if you're not available, guess what? God can't use you. If you can position yourself in a place that someone might call upon you, you might be asked to say something. You're in a position to answer a question. You know, just call me if you need me. If you'll, if you'll put yourself there, then God can begin to use you. But it's hard to be used if you're not around. I don't know if you've ever gone to the shopping you know, for groceries, and, and before you start pushing the cart around the, the store, you said, hey, Lord, by the way, if there's anyone here that needs to be talked to, I'm willing. And then go shopping and see what the Lord will do. Or at the mall. Just, Lord, if there's somebody I can... I, I guarantee you that more often than not, God's going to use you. If you're willing, he's willing. Show me what to do. I want to be available. And, and he's available. You can do it at the beach or at the gym or after church. God will use you if you're willing. And, and the one thing I always like about Paul, is he just sat, went and sat and waited to see if the Lord's going to use me. And more often than not, they called upon him. Well, they might have called upon him because he's well-known. He might not very well have been well-known here. That's a long way away. However, his hometown is just a little ways away, so maybe they knew about him. But whether they did or not, Paul didn't push his way in. He waited upon the Lord. He starts his message in verse 16 by saying, hello to the Jews and to the God-fearers, those who fear God. Whenever a Gentile came to Judaism, but he didn't follow the full conversion route of baptism and circumcision. He was referred to by the Jews as a God-fearer. And so Paul gets up, he, he waves his hand, he, he takes control, or takes command. I, I'm sure that everyone in the, in the synagogue went, oh, this guy, this isn't his first rodeo. He, I'm sure he came across as a very accomplished speaker. He spoke with authority and with, with conviction and he was extremely good at being ready to share what he knew when asked. I would say to you, if you tonight, you, if I was to say to you, you got 10 minutes, come up and give your testimony. If, if, if you weren't ready to do that, you gotta be ready. Just write it out. I started working on my testimony when I was a young Christian, and then I, I would polish it after a while. I got I had verses that made sense to put in there, the things I put in there didn't make sense, and, and you get better at sharing it as the Lord gives you opportunity. So, hey, you got a word for us? Paul, come on up. Paul would go, oh man, I don't know what Barnabas do. No, he was ready. Put me in the pulpit. Now, great, he spoke from verse 16 to verse 41. I don't, I don't think this took long. But man, was it organized and thought through. Three parts. The history of the people, because they love talking about themselves. It would bring you in. The ministry of Jesus set on display, and, and thirdly, and, and finally, if you will, the call to faith. That's really how this lines up. Verse 17 through verse, oh, let's see, verse 30, uh, 22, let's put it there. The history of the people. Verse, and, he, and he does it very general and broadly. Verse 17, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers, exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted hand, he brought them out of it. It was a common practice in preaching and, and, and it, sure, it, it always assures good ground when you speak to Jewish audiences to speak about Jewish history. Like I said, there were a few subjects they would rather talk about than the fact they were God's chosen people. That's still true today, by the way. It is good to come to church as often as you can. I'm glad to see you here during the week with your Bible out. I wish we could sell that to the other 2,000 people that show up on, t on Sunday mornings. And maybe eventually we will, if you'll pray for them, that God will show them. I know not everybody can make it, but man, a lot more people could make it than do. 
But, but you have a great advantage being here because you can, if you stick with us long enough, be able to rightly, I think, divide the Bible. You'll be able to tell the Jewish history, how God raised up a people, how he delivered them from Egypt. You know the story. You, you should be able to communicate it in a way that would benefit others, right? It, it helps you in your growth. Paul begins with these words. God of, the God of Israel chose our fathers and then exalted us as a people. Notice that the work of God always starts there. God chose. God chose Israel as his own. He would tell them, it's not because you're the best, the smartest, or the, or, or, the, or, the, or the baddest, or the greatest, but I've just set my love upon you. It was God's choice. Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. The first 30 years with Joseph, the last 400 as slaves making brick, sometimes with spit. It was a horrible existence. How many bricks did they make? I saw an interesting study a couple of years ago. I, I forget the, the, the TV show that I saw it on, but it was a, a reporting, and it said, if you take all of the bricks out of the Sphinx and the pyramids, you could build a wall 15 feet high and 10 feet thick from here to Brooklyn. So that Trump wall is nothing. <laughs> the Jews were building a lot more. Um, no exaggeration. Can you imagine that? 15 feet high, 10 feet thick from here 3,000 miles across the country. That's how many bricks are found just in the pyramids and in the Sphinx. So they were stuck for 430 years. Paul doesn't go into any of that. He just goes, yeah, God chose us, and for 430 years, we were in bondage. And then God, with his strong power, brought us out. So this quick review, not, not really detailed, a sermon outline, if you will. It is, it is good to know that he's sharing the scriptures, but not having to get into all the minutiae. His point was this, God chose us, and then when he wanted to, God delivered us with his uplifted arm, or on his hand that it, or arm that was lifted high. God is, in other words, powerful, right? The heavens were flung out by the fingers of God, we read in Isaiah. The, the, the Pharaoh was, 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 he saw hopeless slaves that he could control. He was very much mistaken. They served a God that was stronger than anyone or anything. So he starts immediately with their history. God chose us. God delivered us. And then thirdly, verse 18, for about 40 years he put up with us and our ways in the wilderness. We had been so faithless, but we had served a God who had chosen us, delivered us, and had been so faithful. So... They had shown a, an offhanded kind of indifference to the Lord. You know the stories. Paul doesn't go into it except to say, God was good to us even when we weren't good to the Lord. He tolerated our complaining, our murmuring, our unbelief, our rebellion. He put up with us. That's exactly what he says here. A faithful God with his unfaithful people that he fed and led and protected because God, our God, puts up with a lot from us, doesn't he? And so Paul's just saying, he's, he's a loving God. He chose us, brought us out. We weren't very faithful. He stuck with us. Everyone's on the same page now. Verse 20, after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years, all the way until Simon, uh, sorry, Samuel the prophet. Finally, he brought them into the land, and by his power, he gave them victory. I skipped a verse, didn't I? Did I or I did not? Don't yell at me. Verse 19, is that where we skipped? And when he had delivered seven nations sorry, into the hands of the, in the land of Canaan, he distributed this land to them by allotment. So he's just going in order. He brought them finally after 40 years. They had to go wandering into the land. You remember the seven and a half years under Joshua. Um, the seven main tribes are mentioned in chapter 7, verse 1 of, of Deuteronomy. Uh, the Gershites, Ammonites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites, Jebusites, and what was another word? Uh, Canaanites, maybe. Anyway, there's seven there. Um, God m moved the resistance out of the way. He established his people. He reminded Israel constantly of the fact they could have never taken it on their own. We, we were blessed by God. He was our strength. We shouldn't walk in pride, but in faith. Verse 20, which I've already read to you, for the next 450 years, the land over which God watched, God sent them judges. Now, if you were with us when we went through judges, you know that it was one of the worst times in Israel's history. 
the, the reason these judges came is because God kept sending uh, enemies to overthrow his people so that they would get on their knees and cry out for God's help again and, and quit being so cocky and the Lord would raise up a judge and he'd get them off the hook for a while and they'd go right back to it again. We called it syndrome. It was just over and over and over again, these waves of unfaithfulness. During that 450 year time, the people repented and God continued to forgive. Every time he put the pressure on, they turned back. God was a patient God. In fact, if you read the last five chapters of the book of Judges, it'll serve as an appendix to the book. You can get the whole book's kind of the theme in those last five chapters to see how bad it was, had gotten. Well, at the end of those 450 years, here comes Samuel the prophet. By the way, Samuel was the last judge. He is also the first prophet to the nation in an official capacity. Moses was a prophet. But, but this was an official kind of place where, where God sent him to the people throughout the land, preaching and challenging and, and causing for reform. So until that time, and afterwards, verse 21, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, he was 40, and he ruled them for 40 years, and when he had removed him, he set up for them King David as king to be uh, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Up to this point, Israel had been a theocracy. The, the nation asked Samuel, and they said this to him, um, 1 Samuel chapter 8, could you give us a king like other nations? We want to be like the rest of the people. The, the sin wasn't in asking for a king. The sin in wanting to be like everyone else. I want to be like the world around us. That was the problem. And so they rejected the Lord. Samuel came to the Lord in tears and said, they don't want you. No, what he said was, they don't want me. And the Lord said, no, 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 they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So I'm going to give them what they want. I'm going to give them Saul. The word Saul means requested one. You want a big, tall, good-looking guy, a politician with a wavy hair? You got it. Head and shoulders, good-looking. That's the guy. We're all voting for the guy that's good-looking. Turned out to be a horrible disappointment didn't walk with God, didn't serve the Lord, was eventually taken out of the way. And instead of Saul, God gave them who he had chosen. He gave them David. God was not impressed with Saul's size and good looks like the people were. He had a small soul. And God set him aside. But, you know, how tragic when you get what you want and it isn't what God wants. So God removed him, we read here. He had warned Saul for years. He finally removed him by sending him after the Amalekites. The Amalekites were, were a group of folks who had been a, a thorn in Israel's tide for their entire existence, at least coming you know, through the wilderness and all. Uh, he took 2,000 or 200,000 footmen, 10,000 soldiers from Judah. He was supposed to wipe them all out, livestock, king, everything. Save the best livestock, held the king for a ransom, argued with God that you know, he saved the best just to serve the Lord with and to use as a political pawn. And the Lord said, you know, to obey is far better than sacrifice. I don't want that stuff. I want you to listen to me. 20 years later, Saul would, would, would be killed by an Amalekite. <laughs> Never leave residue of your flesh laying around because it may catch up to you. That's, I think that's why we read, reckon the old man dead completely so. Don't flirt with disaster. And any of Kent... Look how fast Paul is covering thousands of years of history. He, he says he calls David. Though like Saul a sinner, David's heart was to serve the Lord and he loved him. He was God's choice. He was given to the people in God's love. He would be used by the Lord to raise the nation to a zenith. If anybody wanted to brag as a Jew, they would brag about the time of David being upon the throne. He was a shepherd. He was a soldier. He was a uh, uh, a statesman, he was a saint. He, he found Israel torn in half, divided by their enemies. He reunites the tribes. He conquers their foes. He, he gives Israel a national consciousness. He writes half of the book of Psalms, if you will, in worship. He repair, prepares for the building of the, of the temple. He puts the archives of their history back in order. He, he brings order to the priesthood. He, he founded Israel's Messianic dynasty, you know, everybody was looking forward to the Messiah coming. In fact, every king after David, they're always measured by David's standard. He was not as like David, or he's almost like David. It could have been sort of like, he kind of looked like David. It's about sometimes that's all you got. But God used this man who had a heart towards him. That was God's testimony. David wasn't perfect, we know that, but he had a sincerity of love for the Lord. 
That's it for the, for the um, history, if you will. Now he's, he's on equal footing. I think people are listening to him now. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's not saying anything wrong. It's like, amen. We're all excited about that. Beginning in verse 23, though, he then immediately jumps way ahead, a thousand years, if you will, right through space, and he goes to Jesus. He says in verse 23, from this man's seed, David, according to the promises, God raised up for Israel a savior. His name is Jesus. From David, Paul makes this leap in history to the fulfillment of God's promises to David regarding the Messiah. You remember that, that David said, it, I think it's in 2 Samuel 7, Lord, I just want to build you a house. I'm living in a palace. You're living in a tent. And the Lord said to David, appreciate that. You're a man of war. I'm not going to let you build it. I'm going to let your son build it. However, I'm going to do you a big favor. I'm going to build you a house. And, and the, of your kingdom, there's going to be no end. And David, hearing that, realized he was talking about the Messiah, the one that would last. And, and it just floored David. It just humbled him so, so tremendously he understood it was the promise. It left him speechless. The guy who writes a lot of songs, this guy had nothing to say. So Jesus is that long-awaited Messiah. He's the fulfillment of God's promises. And here this trained rabbi, Paul, speaks to the congregation in Antioch, and I'm sure that they have never heard this before. I'm sure this was new information, like, you've got to be kidding me, right? That David had a, a throne that God established and it would last and so he, he presents Jesus. He just turns the corner from verse um, 23 to verse 22 to verse 23. Jumps a thousand years ahead. He talks about Jesus. Verse 24. After John, John the Baptist had first preached, be, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all of the people of Israel. That was John's message. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think that I am? I am not he. Behold, there's one coming after me whose sandals are on his feet. I'm not worthy to lose. For men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those of, among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. John the Baptist had caused no small stir as he came out. Thousands of people followed him to the middle of nowhere. On our trip to Israel, we'll take you to where John baptized, almost surely where it is. It, it, it was in no man's land between Two countries, they opened it up, cleared the binds out, and you can drive out now and kind of see the place. You're close enough to where you could step over into Jordan. It's that close. Just if you dive in, I think you can get to Jordan. But in any event, it is a very remote place in terms of Jerusalem. Thousands of people went out there. The national conscience was stirred. He pointed beyond himself to Jesus. And Paul says, you've known about John. I'm sure you've heard the stories. Well, now that word that John preached, his call to repentance, now the, the gospel is being brought to you. Put it on himself. That's what I'm doing here, to bring you the word of this salvation, that this man could bring you back into a relationship with a merciful God through your repentance. The Messiah has arrived. In fact, if you keep there that for a minute, verse 26, flip ahead really quick to verse 28, uh, 38 and verse 39, because this is what he's going to end with. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, anyone or everyone who believes is being justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So, this word of, of, of salvation that he mentions here in verse 26, God offering pardon, inviting man to be restored, offering him his grace, that he has been offering to you since the days of Abraham, it, it, you can almost write in the margin, God, a man's greatest need became God's greatest deed. Right? He came to save us. And, and God's, God's forgiveness is different. Notice what we read here, that everything that you've ever done would be justified by your believing in Christ. The law couldn't do it, but faith in Jesus could. You know, his forgiveness is quite different than ours. We'll forgive but will certainly remember. God forgives and won't remember. Now I know that you gotta take that on faith because you say, well, doesn't God know everything? Oh yeah, he chooses to forget. You can't do that, he can. not You're justified, just as if I'd never, right? I'm seen by the Father, I'm accepted by the Father because he sees the Son 
in my life. And he's going to deliver me, notice verse 39, from all things which you couldn't be delivered by the law or by your own works. Well, here's the thing. It is Satan who seeks to convince you that that's not true. I think some of the biggest struggles for Christians is to bathe in the grace of God. We somehow are convinced, and we see it all the time in counseling, that people will say, well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You know what I was thinking. And I'm thinking, well, no, I don't, but, and nor do I want to. But God knows. And, and the enemy wants to keep you from the grace of God, condemning you, defeating you, wanting to destroy your world, taking away the blessings of knowing that. Here, here's a, a, th- a way you can always kind of keep track. Condemnation will always come from the pit of hell. And the result of condemnation is to drive you away from God. On the other hand, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will have you running towards him for help. There's a big difference. One drives you away, the enemy. The other draws you back to the Lord. The source of of condemnation is always the pit of hell. Well, back to verse 27. Here's Here's the amazing statement. He says to them, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they didn't know him. Nor did they know the voice of the prophets which are being read to them every Sabbath, having fulfilled them them in condemning him. And though they found no fault in him or no cause of death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Amazing statement. Three and a half years, Jesus walks amongst them, walks to the land, the, the breadth of it, the length of it, opens the eyes of the blinds, raises the dead, multiplies food in somebody's hand, miracles without number, according to John 25. And Paul says, of the Jews in Jerusalem, they were there, they missed it. What more credentials could Jesus have shown them? That's one of the arguments from the, from the Gospels. What more do you want me to do? I've done what no one else can do. Additionally, Paul adds here in verse 27, every week in the Sabbath as God's word is being read in the synagogues, no one is able to grab hold of the promises and and the words of the prophets that would have pointed to Jesus. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, suffered and died on a cross, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, John the Baptist being the forerunner, Psalm 69, the crucifixion. This was all being read in church, so to speak while people sat and listened. And somebody would have to say, who's that for? What's that about? What are they talking about here? He would be sold out for a cheap price of 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 12 and 13. You want to say, is anybody listening? And that's Paul's point. You have the evidence. You have the word. You've read it yourself. You just need to act upon what you have heard. So Jesus, I think, early on as he sat with the disciples, He said to them, you search the scriptures, or to the Jews, you think in them you find life, but they testify of me, right? That's where the light shines and the arrow is found, pointing to Christ. So, you know, it should warn us, I think, that it's easy to sit in church every week and you can sit here for years and never grow. There's the possibility exists that you just kind of roll in and out and and, and yet, even if you're taught faithfully, it doesn't get in and change you at all. It happened for one synagogue after the other. Not heeding the word, not listening to the spirit. Jesus kept saying, if you have an ear to hear, listen to what the Lord is saying to the church. So that we should be careful. So may we not become dull of hearing, may we become doers of the words and listen to God personally. But, but Paul points out in verse 27, this has been out there in his work and his ministry and that of John's and the prophets. They, they don't, they don't, and didn't understand that in, in asking for Jesus to be killed, they were actually fulfilling the very scriptures they were uh, ignoring. Though they found no cause of death in him, they talked Pilate into killing him. They did that by, with political pressure. If you've been with us, we've gone through that. They forced his hand through call, all kinds of threats. They said, you know, we have a law. By our law, this man should die. He thinks he's God. They said to Pilate one time, if you, don't, you stand with this guy, you're no, no longer friends of Caesar. <laughs> I mean, Pilate was just on the hook and, and, and he, he voted for himself to be surviving this whole thing. Ver, verse 29, Paul goes on and he says, now, um, when he had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, they laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. 
unless things change and, and God carries, verse 30 is gonna be my Easter message next year. I'm gonna do all of the but gods in the Bible. And there's a bunch of them. When things look tragic and falling apart, but God. When he was dead, but God stepped up. He was seen by them for many days, by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses uh, to the people. Verse uh, 32, and we declare to you good tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us through their children, and that he has raised up this Jesus, as it was written in the second Psalm, you are my son today, I have begotten you. So the, the scripture spoke of his death by crucifixion. They, they, they crucified him. They needed Romans' help. They pressured uh, Pilate to do so. Um, and so verse 29, 30, and 31, he, Paul writes what, what man did and then what God did. What man did, what God did. And they had so many witnesses it would have settled any court question. There were plenty of them. But notice in verse 32 that the, that the tomb is not the end of the story. Death could not hold him. And so there's good news, right? Glad tidings, the promise that God made, God has fulfilled in raising Jesus from the dead. And Paul begins to quote scriptures here to speak about the power of God and the promises of God. He quotes out of chapter two, verse seven of, of Psalms, applying it to the resurrection, to the children of the fathers, that Jesus is the weight of life that he provided. In verse 20, uh, 34, and that he raised him from the dead no more to see corruption. He had spoken and said, I've given you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will now allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served in his own generation with the will of God, he fell asleep and he was buried with his fathers. He did see corruption, but he whom God raised up sees no corruption. So he quotes out of Isaiah 55, uh, 53, he quotes out of Psalm 16. He, he, he literally says this, David died corruption. He, he rotted in the grave. The, the son of God, the Messiah, he died, but he rose. There was no corruption found in his life. God triumphed over death. Verse 38, 39, we just read it. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. To him, anyone who believes is justified from everything which he could not be justified with by the law of Moses. So God raised him up. Through him we find forgiveness. Paul just kind of straightforward tells the story, doesn't he? The history and then Jesus. And then you get to verse 40 and 41 and he just calls everyone to believe. He says, verse 40, beware therefore, lest what you have heard in the prophets come upon you. And then he quotes um, out of Habakkuk chapter one, verse five. Behold, you deceivers, marvel and perish, for I did a work in your days, a work which you by no means believe, though would no, by, by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. He ends with this warning that literally says, you know, our prophet told us in Habakkuk that, that God could do a work and we could miss it. And God is doing a work. He's saving us. He's, he's, he's come to save. It can just go right by you. You can be here in the, in the synagogue tonight and you can miss the whole thing. But he ends by saying salvation is not to be spurned because its cost was too great and its benefits too glorious and the terms were too simple and the alternative is too dreadful. <laughs> you, you can't ignore now what God has done. And like those in the days of Habakkuk, don't let God's work pass you by. God sent his son, by him we preach to you forgiveness. He's the only one through which you can find eternal life. So depart from your sins and come to Jesus. A five minute sermon that took me a half an hour to read, I know. But it was a five minute sermon. It's about as quick and as clean as you know, as succinct as you can find, nothing left out. And I would say to you, if you're looking on how you're gonna share your faith with people, you know, do this. Make an outfit, a line that where, where you cover everything you need, right? You, you wanna talk about sin and, and rebellion and the goodness of God and our need for repentance and God's love in sending his son. I mean, everything's here in a five-minute sermon. And then Paul just leaves it there. The word of God never goes out without 
you know, affecting what he wants. We're going to leave the result to next Sunday, next Wednesday. We want you to come back. This is the one way we can do it. Don't read ahead. We want to surprise you. <laughs> but man, what a, what a glorious trip, right? We've gone on your map all the way through Syria, I mean through Cyprus, up over the mountains. We're in Antioch. We're going to head next after this uh, next week, we're going to head to these three other cities that are another 100 miles back the other direction. Dangerous towns. Uh, it's going to get a lot more hairy than it is so far. But, but God is going to continue to do a work. Here, here's what I hope you go away with tonight, just from the lesson tonight. And that is this. God's word never goes out void. Know that. Isaiah 55, verse 12. Paul and, and Barnabas would teach us that. Leave a place in your life to be available so God can use you. And when he does, share what you've learned. I, I, I think sometimes we write ourselves off because we just say, oh, I can't do that. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I don't know how to talk very good. I've asked people to pray out loud. and go, oh, here, I can't pray out loud. Really? You just told me out loud you can't talk. How is that possible? Just do what you can. You don't have to impress anyone. But do what you can. God's word won't go out void. He'll use those that are available to him and speak with boldness. God has been merciful even when we were very rude. <laughs> his, his grace keeps us. But there's a danger in, in, in the church of sitting and hearing and not doing. But yet God has a work to do. So we can end with what Paul ended on, the words from Habakkuk. God is working today to save. But the work can go right around you. You can be in row nine in the middle. Don't count, I have no idea. But it just gets by. It comes, it goes, you live, you die, you never got involved, you never were touched, you were a part of the whole process. Oh, you're going to heaven, you're gonna make it. Because Jesus' promises are sure. But, but Paul said of Habakkuk, be careful that God's work doesn't just get around you and you miss it. That'd be horrible. You wanna be right in the thick of things. I wanna be where God is, don't you? so that we might see what he wants to do with us. And, and he can do far more than, than the cumulative effort of our abilities. He can use the likes of us. Look around, this should be a disaster. Don't you agree? Look up here, disaster. And yet, God is faithful. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness to us and, and may we learn from the narrative that is Paul's trips now that Luke so carefully records and, and gives to us what your, you as your, your spirit would want us to know, Father. And, and tonight as we look at the sermon in Antioch being invited to speak, uh, John Mark is bailed out, but Paul is faithful. He shows up in church, so to speak. He, he makes himself available. He, he is able to speak. He speaks and covers the whole gamut of the gospel in five or six minutes can't lose sight of anyone, seems to cover all of the bases, covers thousands of years of history, just to, to end up on, on Jesus and, and his death and resurrection and an invitation to come and believe. May you stir our hearts to be convinced that your word is powerful, that we should be available to share it when we get our opportunity, and that we don't want to miss the work that you're doing in our generation. Let it not get by us. May we be an active part of what you're doing. If tonight you don't know the Lord, as, as Pastor Doug was sharing, the pastors are always up front. We would love to pray with you and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. If you'll call upon his name, he'll save you. I don't care where you've been, what you've done, or how often you've done it. He'll save. He'll deliver from sin. He'll forgive. He'll justify your life because of the blood that his son shed. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that's promised to. The, the exchange is he dies, you live. He suffers, you, you prosper. And God will do that for your life tonight. So you come and grab one of these guys and just say, I want to give Jesus my life tonight. And you can mark it down. that This is the day that you entered into eternal life. And God will begin to work in you that as Doug shared, he did, began in his life and, and most of our lives around here. It was that day where you just surrendered and invited the Lord to come in. Ask him tonight. And don't go home until that's been resolved. And for those of you that know the Lord, be available. Be ready to share. Have something to say. It's 
It's important. The world needs Jesus. And he might just very well want to use you to tell them. Are you ready? Shall we stand?